Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. The title is Known Sales of Unknown Journeys. And let me see what I wrote in the subtitle. Did I change it? Yeah, Sailing Beyond Thought. There we go. So in this episode, <clears throat> for me, my whole effort is in some sense that we as human beings are opening up to a new relationship with our own intelligence and we need to pretty much explore it. That means imagine the first time people began speaking, it was like something had to continue, uh, there, there had to be some value of importance with continuing the activity. And in some sense I find evolution is what worked and what didn't work we never knew. Life to the human being, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> life to the human being may appear as a journey. And for those who it appeared as a dream, it appeared as a dream because just like, you know, the movie Inception, they say like the beginning of the dream is not clear, the end of the dream is not clear. Similarly, when we look at history, when we look at the advancements of humanity so far, it's kind of dreamlike. We don't know the or exact origin, we don't know the ending. We are here to kind of be the gears between history. Or the gears that move history. If language is an inner technology, that means there can be more complex developments. When you look at a technology, on some level you may think, like we may think that writing was the end of the technology, but no. Then through new platforms, new cultural developments, it became typing. You see? <clears throat> and meanwhile, throughout this whole thing, speaking, of course, has been there. So in some sense, I find it kind of fascinating that the human mind, human mind can look at a, open the hood of a car and look at that engine, look at that mechanical system, and get a certain depth of it. And the human being can also look at themselves and get a certain depth. What we know tends to stay with us, and it tends to stay with us as image. <coughs> what we don't know is what pulls us, what moves us. There has been times where I kind of felt a sort of infinite space in my inner realms and then I felt anything can be evoked then I realized the mind has the potential to identify with any sort of form in its visibility There is a story of this, uh, I don't know where I heard this story, but it's this story, <clears throat> this Buddhist story that there's this yogi and pretty much this yogi was sacrificing goats, 
Like it was that kind of guy. <laughs> back in the day, this is back in the day where people were way more savage. And so one day this guy catches a goat, this kind of goat sacrifice guy, and he's about to kill the goat, and then suddenly the goat, in some sense, starts laughing, and the guy gets shocked. The goat is laughing. The guy says, goat, why are you laughing? The goat laughs and says, because. The goat is laughing because the goat says, "If I, let me see guys if I remember this story correctly. The goat starts laughing. Then the guy's like, holy shit, this goat is laughing. And he's like, goat, why are you laughing? And then the goat looks at the guy, the... <coughs> goat sacrifice guy and he says because this is my la last lifetime as a goat and the goat is laughing <coughs> excuse me guys sorry for these extra noises The goat starts laughing. The guy now says, "The goat, the, sorry, the goat starts crying now." When the guy goes to kill, now this guy again, he's shocked and he's like, "Goat, why are you crying?" And the goat says, "Because five hundred lifetimes ago, I was a goat uh, sacrifice guy." <clears throat> and the guy never starts sacrificing goats and starts protecting goats. The guy becomes a goat protector because he begins to realize that there is a source of there is a sort of karmic engagement with the world, that based on how real the moment was, the intensity of the karmic imprint is being made. Now, when I say karma, karma is a concept where your inner realms may hold it differently, and the outer realms may have a different plan altogether. For me, the recognition is that it's either pretty much in four ways we can kind of see. I call this the coin of the known and the unknown. <clears throat> the coin of the known and the unknown is this idea that pretty much all human life, really the, at least the human experience, is pretty much the simulation or let's say the presence of a personality in a world. So there is a self, which is you, and then there is a world which you are in, okay? And when we look at evolution, you're te you were technically the world, you separated from yourself, <clears throat> and then named yourself, and in some sense now we are the human being. But on some level, it is in, in some sense, there is a sort of self, and this self is in a known and unknown kind of oscillation, and the world is an unknown, known and unknown oscillation. That means there are moments in this life you may feel like you are how the known, how the world, known world is moving. Like that guy running away from a tsunami, that's when it's, it's a known moment of your world. Now, we say a moment where some unknown event happens, some incident, intense incident happens, that's an unknown world, or even the mysteries of outer space, or the mysteries of inner space, that's an unknown world. In other words, guys, I'm saying pretty much the self is known or unknown or the world is known and unknown. And if you realize that the character and the story of your life is the relationship of the self with the world, and there's really two kinds of relationships that can establish, that's when the person realizes. That's when the person sees that either your sense of self moves the world first, that's your free will, 
or in some sense the world moves your sense of self. Now the world can push the sense of self from unknown into in some sense the known. That means, imagine right now, instead of a solar flare, some sort of wave hit our earth and every human being for a second began moving and as they were trying to hold their balance, this wave kind of made all human beings like, you know, like dance or something, okay? Now, this wave that hit the human being, it hit the human being and there was a moment where there was conscious control, there was free will, there was activity, <coughs> known activity, and then there are moments where it's unknown activity. So when an unknown thing happens to you, it's technically like your world moving you. <coughs> when a known thing happens, the self comes into motion and the self has an ability, has an opportunity. That means you can choose to jump off uh, uh, a sinking ship. You can also choose to you know, be that skydiver that dived into an airplane just because he could. <laughs>
The unknown is the edge of the known. That's how we're approaching it. That means I am in no way trying to tell people there is something else and run towards it. That, that makes no sense. I'm saying that we have only our observation and we start from reality. That means in front of your eyes, you're technically in, in a video game and this video game is made from the elements. Its pixels are the elements of the periodic table. <clears throat> and in regards to the code and program, in some sense, in your external realm, we all share it. It's like every time you wake up in the morning and you go outside, you are in the same world as all those people. And some people in that moment are asleep. In deep sleep, the simulation is not archetypal or conceptual. So for me, I'm saying like, have we, what, how, how have we as a species not realized there's these constant gaps between our waking states? So these constant gaps is really what's making us feel that there's something new. But on some level, it's like, think about it, that your inner realms is the guy behind the screen playing the video game. Your outer realms is the external video game. But this video game is like a virtual reality video game where you it's indistinguishable from like mind and matter are technically indistinguishable. You know, there's there's no such thing as mind over matter or matter over mind. You see, those concepts can coexist. It. They are like twins. That means it's like they are equal. They the equal moment. <clears throat> You know, I think all human morality and empathy just comes from the ability to see yourself in the breath of the world. You know, um, it's kind of like this is a good test to see if a person is ready to move into their inner realms. <clears throat> or not move into, become conscious or start uh, studying the unconscious mind consciously. That means I see Carl Jung as a general shouting to the future generations, make the unconscious conscious. That is life. That is, that is the road. And so all of knowledge is an attempt. All like, Look at the words, the no known knowledge. What we know is our knowledge. And what we know is hovering in the middle of nowhere. That means all meaning, the value of your name, all identity, all of this is a phenomena in space before we localized it to ourselves. Language is an attempt of a species to, <clears throat> I don't know, create a world inside the world that it can relate to. There is this quote from, I believe, Rabindranath Tagore. He says, you cannot cross the sea by merely staring at it. <coughs> and Shakespeare says, a ship can sit at harbor, but that's not what ships are made for. You see, it, it's this kind of universal search for a balance between... Uh, the archaic value and the future design. That's the next kind of Taoistic balance of the moment. That means after you're a person who's playing like with the archetypal kind of duality of good and bad, you've constantly been looking at stuff and you're like, yo, this isn't, this isn't good. And then you look at something else and you're like, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. As, as, you, as you finish playing good and bad mor morality whack-a-mole, then you eventually arise to the complexity, re recognizing that the fractal is the authorization of the realm in the mind of man. What you perceive is your eyes, but your eyes are also somewhere where all the other eyes are. We are rooted in eternity, but the leaves of the tree of the human species are temporary. That means as far as I'm concerned, human beings are an attempt of nature to ex extend herself.
And there's too much design, guys. It's too well designed. You know, like it's kind of like realizing the whole system that you look at your hand and you look at a fruit on a tree and you wonder about like the hand of the person. And you're like, why are fruits kind of designed to our hands? Did our hands adjust to the environment or the, did the environment adjust or know what was coming? <clears throat> you see, there's a lot of challenges for humanity. One, we have to get over the fact that language was in some sense a projection. Language is a simulation. Any words you ascribe to yourself, you can believe you are those words, but on some level, you're also just a phenomenon. Simple. You're a happening among the grand happening of the cosmos. This is why reverence, gratefulness, awe, these were all kind of symptoms that the eyes of the human being is moving beyond an archetypal re relationship because they trust their mind enough for novelty to be reborn. So what that means is there's many transformations in regards to the inner realms and you're going to notice after some point if you really sit still and silent intuitively, if you just listen to your moment, you're going to see what's going to happen is that when you sit still and silent, it doesn't mean there's stillness and silence. Not even in regards to the body. It's just that the mind is used to being dynamic and when it's suddenly made static, it's like a cameraman who's had to like <clears throat> move the camera so many different angles, pan left, pan right, just constant directions and suddenly just have the camera is static and the person doesn't need to move. When the camera is static, it's as if the movement of the characters in front of the scene are important. So meditation is an attempt to make your awareness in the moment kind of like that view of the cameraman from behind the camera. But it's as your whole presence of your whole moment. And when you find that stillness, it's a stillness where you don't have to touch walls for. There's a type of stillness where you need to be physically conscious, constantly have the attention on that stillness. But the best way, guys, to pretty much in meditation... You got to keep in mind that gravity is acting on your body. You're on a planet where there's gravity. So that means you see how the Buddha would put his hands, like the front of his hands, on, on his knees when he was cross-legged. He would do that because he would at some point just find the center of balance. That means when I sit down to meditate, I just put my hands where it's like you're trying to balance rocks on one another, just the body in a comfortable way where it can be still, and then I just stay and watch. In that stillness, as you watch, you get it after, if your eyes are closed, after a while, your spatial orientation becomes adjusted to the phenomena of your inner realms. That means when a person's eyes are closed, <clears throat> it's kind of like... If your body moves, your attention is, of course, most immediately in the body. But if the body doesn't move, and let's say somebody is singing in the room, the music begins moving your inner realms. And it's evocation. So on some level, the mind is the animator or the reflection of the living in the moment. Your mind is, your mind is a ridiculous evolutionary advantage. Sometimes when I look at all the other species, I'm like, you kidding me? Only humans? It's like no other animal no other animal species was this sophisticatedly evolved to wear suits and ties and start building skyscrapers. Only ape, only chimpanzee descendants. You know? And so I felt like well, how odd that if there was some sort of spark, because some people have this view that language was imported. And what they mean by that is that suddenly there came an access. There was something unaccessible, suddenly there came the access. Me personally, I felt there was reality. Then I realized, oh my God, it's too surreal. Because the reality is artificial, the surreal is the ultimate. <coughs> or appears to be.
fear is a paintbrush that the mind doesn't necessarily need. There is greater tools. Trust is a strange tool. You see, we, we for example, as human beings, we're not like elemental mages. We, are, we aren't like how certain fantasy novels would describe uh, these mages as having an ability like the airbender or something. Like having an ability to control the elements of the realm. So imagine just like how you move your hand. That's a set of atoms, right? So imagine your will with the whim of your attention. You could move atoms and uh, like uh, like rocks could suddenly float in there. You know what I mean? There was a inter there was an intimacy with the living presence of the world as the mind. We have separated only somehow limited to our biology. There, there is a time. There was a time that I kind of took Rene. I was, I was suddenly noticing in this insightful kind of intuitive rhythm that there was parallels between Rene Descartes' mind-body dualism and karma being something that really isn't about the physical phenomena. The physical phenomena has its karma instantly, but it's about the inner phenomena. It's about the authorization of a program which is this very profound idea that is the human mind a co-creative effort? If it is a co-creative effort, man's free will will feel as if he's only one dimension in a room of many. <clears throat> if it is more than co-creative, or if it is not co-creative, if it's not co-creative, the pursuit doesn't exist. That means if you don't care to open the door, like you don't even care to see the door to open, like there's no there's no door for you to open. You know? If your inner realms can't perceive you having something, it doesn't matter even if you get it outside. You know? It's all about a sort of recognition that the mind of your world is simultaneously present as the mind of yourself. And that's the relationship we're studying here. We are kind of like the students of the world that are like, okay, <laughs> is this world is this world really the world or is it the projection of the self? Because it's this infinite loop. It's like we ask the world, where did you come from? The world was like, I came from the self. We ask the self, where did you come from? And the self is like, I came from the world. And we see that they are both right. And it is this unique moment in history. It's kind of very un unimaginable, guys, that you don't understand. The fact that right now we as creatures are speaking, do you know how silent this cosmos has been? Do you know that in some sense, speech is like the, oh my God, there's hope. <laughs> Speech is an advanced technology. We take it for so granted. Human beings are constantly recalibrating each other's inner fields. The, uh, even you can enter an environment and just by seeing a sign, you suddenly realize, for example, the environment is closed. You see, we're not just living in a physical reality. We are creatures of great subjective orchestration. 50% the world's moving you, 50% you're moving the world. That means you don't, it's kind of hilarious, right? You don't think about your heartbeat. Your heart is just beating. But you think about what words to write on paper. Could you think it's possible for a writer to get to a point where he doesn't need to, it becomes as natural? The conducting of the mind through attention becomes as natural as how before you think there is a field of knowing. That field of knowing, the Bhagavad Gita talked about it, it touched upon it. It said it was the field of the activity of the knower. And when human beings have gone to go find the knower, what do they find? What do they find? They find that what the Upanishad said, the seer of the scene is unseen. The hearer of the words that's hearing right now, it's unseen. So what it means is the awareness of how there is a self paying attention to itself is attributeless. And that means human psychology is tapping into an experiential continuity, not per se a conceptual continuity.
The mysteries of the world are awakening. They're awakening through the efforts of human beings. And I feel it's like, I'm telling you on some level, yeah, make it a free for all human beings. They can do whatever they want. But on another level, there seems to be some, some patterns of intelligence that are going on on this planet. It's not just, it's not just human activity li cons limited to a material thing. It's like an object is being an unknown sub subject to itself. That is incredibly on, on some level strange, on some level like surreal and strange, on some level fascinating. You know, for me, I, I hit a level of surrealness and gratefulness does you, does this to you. Gratefulness makes you suddenly see the secret edges of the universe. You know why? Because gratefulness is not resisting reality, so it uh, instantly sees. I can't tell you, <clears throat> whoever you are, just in, in life, whatever is happening, just, just look at whatever you are and whatever's around you and just be like, just, just say thank you to the moment. You will be astonished of how much your lack of resistance to the world internally shifts to the karmic outcome. It's literally like how you have chosen to walk as a thought before an object. You know, I constantly find that our attention is like the wind that is moving the sails of the sensory perception in an unknown space. For me, the questions, the moment they moved past sensory perception, there was no concept for it. I only, I like certain things in the, in the inner realms, you just realize they're not meant to be let me tell you, it's like this sense of intuitively knowing what to touch and what to not touch, right? So when you, we can say that if a person touches a stove, their hand burns and they're like, oh my God, I'm not touching a stove again, you know? <clears throat> so similarly in the inner realms, there are moments where imagine there's many stoves in the dark, and if the person doesn't have an intuitive lantern, that means if they don't have a trust that relates to their exact exact objective realm, they won't pursue it, you know. I was um, scrolling on YouTube and this video came from this scholar named Terence McKenna. And Terence McKenna, it was this audio book, like the guy was saying it himself, his audio book. And it was an audio book of his journey in the Amazons. And he had just heard, like him and his brother, Dennis McKenna and Terence McKenna, these two guys were like geniuses in their own circle, you can say. And so what it was, was that they in some sense kind of considered that perhaps the alteration of the sensory perception was a suggestion that beyond, the, like, it, it, but perhaps the only place like that, like if the extrasensory is a simulation of time, and if the sensory perception shifts and it shifts your sense of time, then you are in a space where you're observing time. So I'm telling you that um, 
the more complex and sophisticated the interpretation of human dimensions becomes, in some sense, the more the character has room to change. That means, believe it or not, the more technology comes out, just the shows, there was this comedian saying, like, without TV shows, he, he, he might have, like, ended his life, and it was, like, this intense moment where the civilization is just, like, at present. It's like a bunch of, we're 8 billion kids inside a classroom, and we're waiting. And we're like, when's the teacher coming? Only to realize that it's not a classroom. It's a battlefield. It's a battlefield where language tries to possess you. And the young child that has emotional trust may not realize this. That means you could be a person where, like you see, the emotional relationship is very non-story-like. <clears throat> You know, sometimes I feel it's like when a human being sees another human being suffer, the, the only way they're relating to it is through their mind. So their mind suffers. That means when we realize one man's pain is mankind's pain, then we'll be like, holy, like the species better start getting advanced, you know. <clears throat> there is the evocation of archetypes. Sometimes when a person in some sense wonders about the unknown, there can be a sort of boredom. There can be a sort of, what is this? Is this something happening? But it, it is a state where the free will has to be subsided. And it doesn't mean your free will goes away. It just means your free will becomes space. And then whatever happens in the space is your will. Your will is the field. So right now, you are being an object, but you also have an ability to be a field. <clears throat> I'm not joking. Seriously, we human beings can have a certain mindset where we sit somewhere and we can become a field. And this field is rhythmic. Literally, it's like connect how you connect a USB to a computer. It's like certain rhythms connect to the human being. But they don't connect as temporary phenomena. They connect as remembrance. So as the person uh, goes, uh, reverse engineers back <clears throat> in, uh, in their psychology to what they are, they come to their earliest memories and their earliest memory will be non-conception. That means if we were a robot trying to remember, it would be like access denied. <laughs> So after some point, you're not a creature of thought. So your memories are based on the depth of the movement. And if we consider that memories can move through space freely, then it would be totally different. That means when a person has a thought as if it's something pushed in a vacuum, it's just there's no resistance to it. It endlessly goes, you know. <clears throat> I feel that... Um, our minds are so advanced that this was a very complex thought and I thought that it's uh, eventually I realized it's a sinking ship and I let go of the idea. But what it was was the notion of multidimensionality being taken to the point where it's like right now you are an individual with multiple views of that individual of the world. But there can be a world where it's like one set in, in one embodiment, there is multiple lives being lived. Do you know? It's a very abstract kind of concept. It's, it tends to not come up ever, I think. But, but, it, but it's like an idea where it, it's a suggestion that uh, the multidimensional lives in the singular and the singular lives in the multidimensional. That means we can say all human life is being an atom of time. That 1% is time. That They say 99.9% .9 of the atom is empty. And that 1%, <laughs> that 0, 0.000 whatever, 1% is time. At least that's how Mr. Matan sees it, you know.
Albert Camus, this French existential atheist, absurdist. Albert Camus, even though he was an absurdist, he, absurdity is, is, is one of the, you can say, faces of the unknown God. He says, in the depths of winter, I found within me an invincible summer, an invincible summer. He found his will. He found the eyes that can't be defeated. He found the attention that has no hands to be empty. You know, this is um, in mathematics, time can move backwards. There is the suggestion that it, um, I think the book was called Fractal Time. It was this suggestion that this guy felt that in the math, in, ma in the math, in, in a sort of, if we could treat mathematics as a language and language as a sort of image upon the world, a painting of the world, <coughs> mathematics was like a space that allowed for the whole world to rewind. There was this strange thought that the whole world is going, it's like fast forwarding towards something. And then it suddenly starts rewinding. Everything, imagine, rewinding backwards. This guy was saying as if, like, could the apocalypse be the rewind button <laughs> on this film of existence? And so there was that kind of idea. But the way I had kind of, I, I had kind of scoped through the universe of mathematical language, I can say... I had this view that I felt all those people who thought they had spirit guides and guardian angels and angels and archangels and all these ideas, even the extraterrestrial, I felt all these were masks for our, the human future self, which is not an individually conscious entity. So I felt that the future manage to master time when it mastered time it became a sort of godly free to observe that god freedom of the future means that in some sense how can i tell you it's like it's like on some strange way as simultaneously as the universe started from nothing into something something is also becoming nothing and we human beings are in the, in the verge of these two macro dimensions. That means I remember my whole life I saw creation and how things change in life and things are destroyed in life. You know, for example, you see in... Um, in Wedic thought, the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu... And Shiva, Shiva the destroyer, the archetype of destruction. Vishnu, the archetype of the maintainer. Brahma, the Vishnu, the archetype of the creator. Uh, the, uh, the archetype of the creator. We had the creator archetype, the maintainer. Guys, it, it tends to be a common, common uh, response, I think, universally, that when, when, when human beings care for what the unknown, life gets a sort of atmosphere of importance. My whole thing is, there's a lot of unknown here, what do we do? 
for, for how long do we let the movie direct us? We let the world direct us. The world has been directing everything. Everything. Only fairly recently in this long time span, we have in some sense been directing the world. Now, I thought that there is this reverse modality and duality. So in some sense, what I was saying was this, guys, I found even patterns like, like echoes of this in history. Like I'll tell you, this idea that our future, our future self is a collective mind. That means right now we are individual objects, but our future self is a collective subject. It's a collective mind. Okay. So imagine, just like how drops evaporate, most things in their transformations, they change texture. And I was like, all right, so if, there, if the human being goes through a great transformation, whatever that is, what would change? And it would be the texture of individualhood. You know, life is like this. The speed of the outer realm sometimes can be controlled. And sometimes they can't. Anyways, the pattern of it was that this idea that the future self is a collective mind. <coughs> there was this, um, you know what it was? There was this saying, I don't know where it was. I think I read it online somewhere. <laughs> it was this saying where this guy, this voice was, it was as if it was written in some text. And this voice was saying that was speaking to the future. You see, most people right now, they're speaking to the present or at most for, I don't know, there's some, you know, strange denominations of therapy where they, they have the person speak to their past, you know. <laughs> I mean, sure, you can speak to the past and the past could be whatever the future wants to be. But, <laughs> but anyways, but the idea of speaking to the future, the idea of someone giving a podcast and not talking to anyone who's alive now, but talking to those who will be alive later, for example. <clears throat> if that, it's like, that's the narrative. And the guy was saying, we live for you. We live for the future so that the future can live for us. And what that means is, imagine the future reaches a state of collective or some sort of intelligence uh, threshold or epitome and when it reaches that peak, it resurrects all its memories. It becomes the moment where if everything that has ever happened in existence was the universe's memory, the universe reaches a state of, imagine, instant where every phenomena is. That means destruction was another dimension. That means it's like on one level, yeah, it's your one being and you're, you're born and you change and you die. Yeah, like that's one view. But another view is that birth is, it was its own dimension and change is its own dimension and death is its own dimension. And these three dimensions are the same. And if you go in ancient temples, you see the gods had three faces. The god had a face in his front and then instead of ears, they had two other faces. Like that's, you know, and that was the whole point that it was as if there were three dimensions. They were, there were beings that they were being three, they were living three lives at the same time. Do you see? They were living, they were so badass, they were living three lives in one life. <laughs>
the mystery of the evolution of the human mind, the edge of the unknown journey. Regardless of what human beings know, it's all wind hitting a sail, and in some sense there is more unknown than there is known. Pretty much the species has certain kind of like I feel chess moves to make. These chess moves are not inspired out of fear and they're not inspired out of reward. They're inspired from the simple idea that if we are alive, we want to see. We want to see it. We want to see whatever is here. You know, and so it's the effort of looking at the edge of knowledge to find a new way to enter the unknown. Sometimes my experiences with my intuition, with my feeling that there's something else in the moment, you know, it, it goes through certain extremes. You can sometimes feel as if your whole moment is like a simulation. You can sometimes feel your mind saw like an optical, like not optical, but let's say subjective uh, illusion. You know, so the mind is animate. It's literally like you going outside your home and the wind hitting you and the sun rays hitting you and like, you know, you hearing sounds, various things suddenly emerge. And so when there is a concrete sense of self, it's like you learn from your fluidity. That means all those people, it, it's kind of strange. It's like you automatically see the other side by declaring on being one side. Like the moment you think you're good, you see the bad everywhere. You're like, yo, that person's doing something bad. You know? <laughs> the moment you think you're bad, you're like, oh my God, everybody's so good. You know? <laughs> Your attention goes on the other side. For me, it's it's like, I just want to see what's behind the eyes of the inner realms. Better, better than Santa giving gifts to kids, is a gift, the children giving gifts to each other by sharing their inner realms. You know, that means this is the argument about why communication is important to, in some sense, protect human nature from the various systems it's living through. There was this guy who was like a hero. This guy was the true Avenger, you know? Where this man, this old man in his like, I don't know, 70s or something, this retired person, uh, I think this was in America, you know? And there was this bridge where a lot of people would use the wrong way and it was a, it was a tragic situation where a lot of people would stress. And at night, every night, this guy would go for a walk. And he would go for a walk and he would see suddenly there's a person standing beside the bridge. And he would go and talk to that person, you know? And he would invite them in his house for tea, you know? And it would be some situation where as if there is a certain level of humanhood that must be preserved or the human being falls into savage deterioration. That means it's like, it's like imagine you are a great... Uh, singer and you're also a great warrior now this warrior goes in battle but eventually realizes if it continues it, it in battle it, it discontinues its realities in singing for example Human communication is all we have really. Other than that, we're just sitting silent. We're not that much of a telepathic civilization, but the internet is kind of, you know, it's our like first attempt at the teleportation of thought. The fact that this is a live stream right now is like, is like it's at least proving that sound is teleporting. Do you know that means human beings successfully teleported sound and image? Now, when it comes to human nature, teleporting a human being, 
into let's say some other planet some other place now that would require a different recognition that means when human beings understand the soul like an image teleportation technologies will then happen but the soul for now i think no it can't be understood as an image that means if your soul was a coin one side of it it can't have an image it's the space of matters intelligence and then you see on the other side you don't know what it is <clears throat> there was a time i remember it was uh 2017 for two days for two days i had some unique perception in my inner realms that made me feel convinced that I was in in some sense simulating my life on earth from a total different location than earth a total different space <clears throat> and I was going under that impression and throughout the day there were intense things sometimes I I do I don't want to say I see it's like I don't see anything the moment is the moment I see the moment I see the sight is the moment that's what that's the extrasensory whatever I, I I would say I can relate to the extrasensory for me is not the movement of image the images come and go the objects come and go the subjects come and go but the mover the mover is the wakefulness it is the ever presence it's the Satchitananda it's how consciousness that the moment you're conscious you're existing there is the the aroma of the inner bliss it's so simple conscious existence is bliss that means if you as a human being on this earth can simply observe and be conscious that your existence and observe that simplicity the complexities of the world will wait for you that means they will they're waiting for you that means this world has the strange strange gravitation that those who truly see it it calls them forth <clears throat> this is why I'm telling people we shouldn't have this kind of uh, every person having a plan all the time that's a, that's that doesn't work we're kind of like antennas we got to be conscious of the environment just by tonality you know emotions are cr across time and space this world of ours is so much more complex than we've sculpted it to be and I feel just like how the political system is behind the most updated citizen of that system. You begin to see similarly, it's like language is behind the most updated experience of the human being. That means do not fear the silent, your silent presence, which is synonymous with, this, with the presence of all. My brother is, is, is an incredible, honestly, he inspired me to write science fiction. And uh, my whole science fiction is a tribute to him, actually. And uh, he had this a character in one of his stories. And this character in his stories had this line where the moment he said it, I was like, it's such a powerful such a powerful statement like as when you look at it from the viewpoint of a writer he said the character was in a situation where there was chaos and the character this character was shouting fear nothing love all fear nothing love all like it was this this character just going into this 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 profound this profound moment where it's as if you see the apocalypse coming but the humanity is still in your eyes and you stand your ground
you know, I had this vision. And I don't know if I'll, you know, if the vision was for this plane of existence or another. That means I don't know if the, I'll ever do this, but I saw this situation where human beings all around the world <clears throat> have become advanced communicators. And guys, I can't tell you how incredible this vision was. It was as if every violent thing, every bad news in the TV I saw for a second changed. It wasn't the bad news I saw. It was how in that instant I saw all the good news that could have been there. And I realized we are just cute creatures right now where our attention is like mice looking for cheese. And when we transcend mice looking for cheese, we step into an era where human communication is acknowledging a much more multidimensional platform to its ideology, to the inner realms. We're suddenly conscious. We can totally see when a person is upset, they go into their inner realms like a turtle going into their shell. You see, when a person is shy, they go into their inner realms like a turtle, their shit, that, that, <laughs> that's shy. And so you see that, it, that movement in the inner realm, if you, if you feel rejected from the outer realm, you won't care for it. And that leads to some sort of view where you can say, like, I remember I was having a cigarette in downtown Toronto, and I was like, is this guy shouting at a building? And the guy, yeah, he was shouting at a building, you know. And I don't know if he was even shouting at a reflection in the window of the building, but the guy, he, his inner realms had made him oblivious that he was actually existing in the outer realms. And that is a sign of a, fail, a failure of a civilization, by the way. That means it, it's, it shouldn't be normal for human beings to accept defeated comrades on the battlefield. That means it, ha it's, it's, it has to be a lift up, massive lift up attempt of every human being. That in every moment of your life, if your justification is inefficient, that means there can be an inefficient, there can be an efficient one. You see, it's, it's like if you don't know your freedom, you'll never fight for it. You'll never know. If you don't know the value of something, it leaves your moment very easily. But if you know the value of something, if your heart feels that it is familiar with the world, there is a quote that Hafez, the Sufi mystic poet, says, he says, your heart and my heart are very, very old friends. And what he means is that the ancient core of what, it, what this inspiration pattern of evolution is, is one wave. The species emerged as a wave. It's, it's a signal. We are, imagine we are the signal. We are the extraterrestrial signal. <laughs> We're like, when's this extraterrestrial signal coming? Oh, oh my God, we are. <laughs> there's something, there's of course something mysterious. It's, it's like speech gives you the ability to move the vision towards either the known and the unknown. And I realized that the known is the bottom of the mountain. I thought the known in my childhood, I thought knowledge was like the top of the mountain. I'm going to climb this one day only for me to realize, no, the sky is the top of the mountain.
Sorry guys, I had to handle something. <coughs> The unknown is really the stretching of experience, known experience. Sometimes your mind can communicate to you. There's been times where I've looked at my own memories and I've tried to see patterns in them. I've tried to see in some sense, why did this event happen at this age? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? And I've come to certain profound insights only to realize eventually it goes beyond pre-thought that pre-thought has to become the trust of an unknown rhythm or nothing moves in your inner realms. Once that trust is there, you're technically trusting how your mind is being attributeless space. When that trust is there, that trust immediately activates a memory. So that means that's when you experience in life intuitive knowing before it's like there's a certainty coming from a knowing of the behavior as the moment of being, not as just the person in the moment. Imagine your attention was a once-in-a-lifetime once opportunity to be an explorer of your species to figure out what is the relationship of the intelligence with the plane of existence. You know, I'm kind of giving this as a briefing to anybody who's going to hear this talk even, you know, after I'm gone. Like, I feel like anybody who's going to hear this talk, it's as if, like, uh, among what it's okay to live your individual life, live whatever life you want, but while you're living that life, reality has a multidimensional option. And so when you can multiply, see multiple values in the same moment, that means you can be aware of multiple contexts through the same self. When the self is seen as a particle, all stories dismantle to an atomic elemental existence. When the self is seen as a process, it's seen as a wakefulness integrative to the movement of the world. That means it's as if like, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to say 
if the wind is alive, it's like somebody, imagine somebody, the first person who felt wind. He was like, yo guys, something just hit me. I don't know what it was, you know? And then they're like, what hit you? He's like, I'm telling you, some some random feeling just hit me out of nowhere, guys. You know, this this coldness came out of nowhere. I don't understand it. You know, and the people were like, don't freak out, man. What do you mean coldness came out of nowhere? You know? And imagine these people were so primitive, they didn't know what wind was. And it was wind hitting them, and they felt it was something else. Do you see? So we can even attribute, uh, we can pers personify the inner realms and the outer realms as much as we want. You know? That's what children do to some degree, but they do it with the freedom that they are beyond it. You know, for, for me, I feel it's like the educational system can make just few slight changes and you know how many imaginations will be saved? <laughs> I'll share you a very I'll share with you a very strange dream I had. In this dream, this was a couple of years ago, I woke up in the eyes of a person who I had never seen. I woke up through the eyes. That means I was looking through the eyes of a person. Guys, just a recommendation, just a random on a random tangent. Anybody, I think when a person goes to sleep, you are in some sense going towards uh, deep sleep. And that means you got to get comfortable with stillness and silence. That means before you sleep, just acknowledge the stillness and the silence and just trust and that's it. Silence and stillness are the greatest allies of the bewildered mind. And bewildered as in like the Bibu Gita spoke about the human being as this bewildered creature. And do you know how fascinating that is? The creature, your animal instincts is a suggestion that we became conscious more than just nature. nature. That means we, we in some sense found a wakeful civility.
gosh, guys, I kind of set myself off. There was a story I wanted to share. But which story was it? <laughs> Anyways, guys, I don't know how to explain it. It's like human language, that's one thing. That means it's like you want to understand human character, wherever you are in this world, go study human language. Language is really what's keeping individuality afloat, you know. Human beings have had many different kinds of quality of observation. You know how many Japanese sages have just sat on rocks and observed their world and their insight has come to them from their attention? This world of ours is being simulated into conscious relativity. Oh yeah, I was sharing with you my dream. There we go. And conscious rel relativity really relates because pretty much in the dream I find myself in the eyes of this person I've never met, uh, been. This person storms out of this house and comes into the yard and from there my attention leaves. And I suddenly find myself falling in front of the window in front of my room but then, from the window in front of my room, I wake up to myself in the bed. And that was the first time I wondered that could it be that the mind, like Rene Descartes spoke about the mind-body dualism, the mind is its own dimension, and it, it, it exists in a dimension that surpasses time, so there's no categorization. And then I thought, if, what if the body is in the particle? What if the body is the puppet for an intelligence beyond time, pretty much? That's like an inspiration for the unknown, where we're trying to discover our true multidimensionalhood, or what we really are. For us to be empty is too easy, you know? Nihilism, the nihilistic trap is too easy. It's too easy to see emptiness. Seeing value takes time. When you look at an artwork, you can take a glimpse of it and be like, yeah, I don't like this paint on this canvas, you know. Or you can zoom into it and suddenly see the artist has done something. So you see the, the, the pace of your care for the moment suggests a lot about how open you are to the moment. <clears throat> You know, in my inner realms, I have had and moments where I've experienced myself, my sense of self in the world is pure geometry, unknown living geometry. So what that means is right now, do you see how convenient it is for us to see cells? Like you see your skin cells in your, over your body and you see it's this constant, com this complex relationship of intelligence, the human body. <clears throat> that means doctors are inspired because there's as many mysteries inside the body as there are outside. Now, just like how comfortable it is for the mind right now to be like a body, physical body, the skin, the being, the, the actual biological being, organism. In the inner realms, one can find the same ambience and comfort, but as geometrical shape. The mind has a strange ability where it gives you access to a room that nobody else can see really. Yeah, guys, the, these, um, the inner realms are, it's kind of strange, like, it's, um, 
pretty much like treating your mind like a still bowl of water and then what looking for ripples on this it's it's from this subtle stillness you notice the movement of your mind the moment you notice the movement of your mind you understand what evolution meant you understand all your ancestors had no clue what was coming they were all in awe of the unknown that means the fascination for the unknown is one of the most closest things we share with our ancestors for those of them that cared to live in the world for me it, it's like we we take for granted how for a long time in history a lot of sophisticated stuff would happen on earth but it wouldn't be documented and so you know and you can say like when Mr. Within tells you that you should be a hunter-gatherer of your inner realms, it's a suggestion that while you're alive, you're trying to comprehend the depth. Not just perceive life only through how long it is or what it is, but to see the implication of the process. What clue in your own eyes do you get of that which is beyond them? Then you suddenly, the moment it becomes real, like, like Sadhguru says, if people got a glimpse, for me, I, all, all enlightenment, it, it, it had bad PR, and it didn't have bad PR, it had bad PR, as if those people who created it, they, were, they cared for the people of Ben, but they couldn't fathom the effects of the, af, the, after, the aftermath of it. What that means is like a philosophy is like a meteor. It hits and it has an impact ideology is floating everywhere really it's like you can say ideology is everywhere and every time a child wakes up in this world they kind they have ideology gravitate to them as if your sense of self gravitates to itself the images of itself how fascinating the mind has a self gravitation and i think it's just the realization uh, that we are multidimensional beings and we're, we are right now the pioneering human human beings alive in 2020 which are realizing that we are observing our thoughts we're no longer them so when you're no longer your thoughts in some sense you see the underlying freedom of direct experience where that's really where life was happening do you know there's so many people who, in some sense, I think the greatest wisdom is to be observant of your inner realms and outer realms, really. That means, imagine you're in a situation and person A and person B, they're communicating, and person B attempts to break person A's inner realm. Person A's inner realm can only break if person A forgets person A's inner realms and sees person B's inner realms first. And you don't know how much of life and instincts, biological instincts, is because of a sort of sequential belief, like a series of beliefs. It's like, it's, it's like a jingo of beliefs that's kind of giving commands to your biological body. Like by Jenga, I mean that like wooden block tower thing, you know. <laughs> and I think this talk is good, guys, because I'm going to at least, you know, say that the hu humanity asked itself one night. That the unknown winds that blow the known sails on this unknown journey. The unknown is the depth of the potential. Everything is changing in the sense that either concept moves or context moves. When you understand this secret of characterhood, you become aware of what is called the language threshold. That means you begin to realize that the moment is evoked. 
you have to create moments. For example, in regards to human communication, most people are trying to find the right moment. They don't realize you have to create it, and you can only create it if you feel you deserve to exist. Individualism is, when I say language is an advanced technology, that means your identity through language is an advanced interpretation of being. That means when the mind is felt to be unknown, it's as if all content of the mind are like hieroglyphics. You're like, okay, how do I interpret a pigeon's head? You know? <laughs> you know? Don't seek knowledge for certainty. Seek knowledge for wonder. It's the reawakening of the mysterious. The how reality finds an inseparable inseparability with the surreal. That can that can be an observance. <clears throat> Ignorance is its own fool as well. You see, in chess, there's no certainty for victory. There's only the potential. The person in, in, in some sense war, I believe Sun Tzu even spoke about this, that realizes the edge fights the sharpness. Right now, you may be a person thinking that your intelligence or who you are or who you think you are or what, you, what subject you, of yourself you see yourself in the mirror. The mind has an ability to, to be the subconscious. In activities of physical engagement, the subconscious becomes this, this trust automatically. If the world is potentially echoing the patterns of a collective future mind, that means it is the peak evolution of the individualhood. That means we are moving beyond mythology. Ooh. The species is moving beyond the requirement of the idea of mythology. The concept of fractals destroyed myth. <coughs> there was this concept I spoke about where I called it in the future there's going to be elemental units but I call them the, uh, the, the earth, air, fire, water, ether unit. And what that means is I, I mean, I'm not, I'm just one person in yours who build and show that starts talking, but, <laughs> but like on another level, based on my sense of how I've perceived so far in this moment, I can say that in the future, there a good way, you see community has to come from speaking the same language. That means if every person knew the periodic table, they would strangely know the same language, you know? Like there is a phase that when the person runs towards the unknown with desire, they are kind of waiting for their mind to bring heaven. There is that phase. There is, there is a sort of desire part of the mountain 
of the mystic's journey. The confrontation of desire is the same way as saying, how do we get a warrior about to slam down a sword in a battlefield to drop the weapon instantly? When your attention moves, be, uh, when your attention moves before thought, you are your whole moment. In some manner, you can see human existence as a sort of energy to build something. <clears throat> that means this is hilarious, but you know how in ancient Egypt there's the idea of like this this pharaoh or this kind of, these overlords taking over Egypt or something? Like when you kind of like... <laughs> Look at like ancient Egyptian thought. After some point, you're like, okay, did did a nation of ours get harassed by an alien species without us knowing about this? You know? <laughs> at some point in our history. But anyways, anyways, human beings because they live in a system, they will wonder about the driver of that system. When they wonder about the driver of that system. They will inevitably come to more access of the system, then comes the test of will. By the way, guys, uh, questions are also welcome in the live stream. Sometimes you gotta realize these talks are like a digital notepad. I'm kind of like, my own mysteries are kind of like right where my eyes are moving, you know. So you can say it like this. Imagine right now, people were used drinking like a cup of water, okay? Just a simple human activity. Now, when we think of an advanced civilization, maybe in an advanced civilization, you just command the house and suddenly from your fridge, like a glass of water just, you know, just hovers and comes to you. Do you know? As if Jedi powers before you need to be a Jedi. Your house is a Jedi, you know? <laughs> So you can see that's how an advanced civilization would be, or it would be an update of what currently is there. And that's what I'm saying. When people stop wondering about the new update of their own psychological disposition, then they in some sense forget that the free will is here to draw. It's like, it's like for the mind, the only advice you can give it is unleash yourself while you're in the world. You know? And when I say unleash yourself, it doesn't mean like w w narratives of chaos and order are dictating human nature it's it's just that there is there is a, before you were before you learned language like you you were a presence that means it's like human beings we forget silence is a language oh man we should totally treat silence like a language i'm going to give a talk on this you know that's an incredible way to see it silence is a language like think about it we, we teach to the children of humanity how to, how to, in some sense, speak and make sophisticated mouth noises. <clears throat> and on another level, 
there's the silence is the space between the words of speech, between the sounds a human being makes. So silence is part of the sentence. Part of your life is also the gaps in it. So as long as there are gaps in life, there's mysteries. That means you can find truth, then you blink, you're like, oh man, the mystery's gone. And then you open your eyes, oh, mystery's here. Oh, you, you blink again, oh man, the mystery's gone, what is this? <laughs> <clears throat> it's, it's just about the evolution of sight. For me, I, I, I feel like this is the most intelligent thing human beings can do. <clears throat> And this is Mr. Within's idea of civilization 2.0. Because I have no idea who, who's going to be hearing this talk in the future. The idea of civilization 2.0 is that imagine you liked animals. You thought they were allowed to exist. And you suddenly looked at nature and you wondered that, oh man, so many human beings are butchering animals. If an extraterrestrial species came and asked us, is it okay to destroy inferior species? What would we say as a species? We would be like, holy shit, you know? <clears throat> so it would be a situation where I think it's like we have to let, let the earth breathe. And human beings are like kind of masking the potential of the world. Because as I'm speaking, trust me, it's just common sense. As more structures are being built, more natural land is being consumed. <clears throat> Strangely, like, the writer is writing, you know, in the grandchildren of a dying world, you know, on the grandchildren of a dying world. The, the paper is like, they're transforming. See, many things are transforming in life, really. You can't even keep it too much as an image. With every breath, it's like it's every time you breathe, is that a new self with a new belief? <laughs> we are an attention. We are your mind is like space. And I think when you master space, your reflexes become really sharp as a person. I'm not joking. When you become comfortable with space, that means your mind has allowed itself full movement in that space. And it's like if you're not comfortable with your own, how your mind animates the world for you, then you in some sense haven't realized you are the pilot. You're the pilot of your attention. Who can save you like as if like you're sitting on a chair and all the greatest teachers in the world are like, the teaching is to stand up, man. That's the teaching. Just stand up. You know, and you're like, no, no, I don't believe in teachings. <laughs> You know, and you're just sitting on that chair. You know, and after some point, it's like all the teachers stop and you realize you're the only one who has to get up from the chair. It's like, how much are you going to pray for someone to get you up from a chair where you can only get up from? <clears throat> so that's the thing. You got to kind of sometimes in life realize you've been in, sitting on a chair of belief your whole life. And then you just get up from that chair. You're like, oh my God. Was there, was there novelty in the world that could redefine me? And you'd be like, yeah. <laughs>
was living for the moment pretty much. And that being who's living for the moment, their honor is defined by the intensity of their experience in one moment in space and time. <clears throat> so you see, honor was a momentary evaluation of reality's inspiration. Yeah, honor was a moment-to-moment -moment thing. You see, guys, I don't know how to say it, but like, on some level, we can't deny the fact that we all have 8 billion different DNA. So on some level, the responsibility of the eyes that only we have is ours. So the inner realms exist to maintain the self, but the outer realms exist to remind the inner realms that they are not alone. So you see, after the cultivation of the inner realms, at most, you're trying to get comfortable with some sort of complexity and some sort of simplicity. And when you get comfortable with simplicity, you suddenly realize the heavy urges of, of a conflict leave. So you don't know how much stillness can make the body, in, like think of it this way, as if there's a sort of strange memory field your body's existing in, and... If the body is intensely turbulent, let's say like as if your body is a plane of, like an airplane and you're the pilot, if the plane becomes too turbulent, regardless of how smoothly the pilot moves the controls or how the belief of the inner realms is, still the moment is turbulent. So you see in life, there's, there's on some level, we, we kind of like, where humor comes in is in this kind of artificial ability to shift the world. But when reality comes in is caring for what's actually there. So you see there's this concept that believe it or not, this man named Sadhguru on YouTube, he spoke about it in such a nice way where it was just etched in my memory that is it. Where he said it's as if it's all about life sensitivity. And that's the beautiful, that was the ingenious thing that Sadhguru did in that moment where he said life sensitivity, because you realize the modern world is, it is so, it's, it's strange. It's as if rather than the person realizing whatever vision you have of the future, you don't know how long your breath is going to be here. So on some level, we have to master the ability to receive our moment simply as moment. Okay, this is what this moment is. Then the, this is what the other moment is. It's just like just being, a, being aware and it's like you watch your you you are like your mind is the watcher of the self that has that has embodied a brain. That means on some level, how can we name atoms? So do we say naming atoms is a hallucination of an electron? <clears throat> the mystery is the subjective evolution. The objective evolution, of course, was a great contribution. You know, Darwin, guys, was uh, ahead of his time, but it was probably awkward, you know? They're like, Darwin, so tell us, what does your research say? He's like, yeah, you're all monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, don't be rude, Darwin, tell us. And he's like, I'm not being rude, man, I'm telling you the truth. And he's like, what do you mean? <laughs> he's like, did Darwin just call us monkeys right now? We invited him, you know, to this aristocratic dinner of nobility. <laughs> and Darwin wasn't wrong there, it's like I am in no way denying evolution I feel that you can always create space as a dimension so what I mean by that is that like there is this thing that in certain fundamentalist monotheistic views the world was made in 6,000 years. For example, it's known that certain 
Egyptian archaeologists, they asked them how old was this artifact, and the Western European archaeologists that were there knew that this thing was older than 6,000 years, but they all had to write in, the, in their books 6,000 6, years because of the system of politics of the moment. So, so you see, it's, it's very fascinating how life is. You know, the attention chooses what ideas live on, what truths keep uh, 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 flickering in the dark. You know, a lot of violence, you know why it happens? Because the person wound, strangely wounds their inner self, something wounds their inner self. When the inner self is wounded, the person doesn't care for gentleness. The moment you don't care for gentleness, it's like, oh man, you know, it's like they should put you in a virtual reality simulation where you're in this endless warrior. <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of like how the Diamond Sutra would say, keep your mind alive and free without abiding in anywhere or anything. After some point, you will see there is no, there is no truth in the way you are looking for to find something. It is, it is just the witness so instantaneously being that there's no time to refer to it. It's like the center of the circle is not in time. The center of the wheel of karma is timeless. The wheel is time, time, the karmic time. I feel the advantage of our species and civilization is its mind, really. And I feel the educational system is wasting it. I gotta say this. And some people would may say, what do you mean, Mr. Within the educational system is wasting people's minds? And I'm like, the potential is not in how much they can memorize something and repeat it. The potential is that oh, the mind of the child is an explorer of how far knowledge should go. That means the younger the child is, I feel the more complex idea you should share. Do you know? Let me tell you why. Because children have a vividness in their imagination. Imagine like middle schoolers being like, all right, for homework, how do you solve world hunger? How do you solve? And the child can't, like, has to write its own answer. And how many unique answers would be given? And imagine there was an archive of like the greatest social professors studying those answers and being like, holy shit, so, so many of these ideas are revolutionary. So we would see that it's about where the world finds it because there is this delay. You can say like uh, in my inner realms, I, I am multi-local. In my outer realms, I'm just this. And when I say in my inner realms, I'm multi-local because we have access to memories. Do you know, that means like when you remember your childhood, is that like, uh, you know, should that state of mind be punished? No, it's just, it's just, it's just a state of mind. It's just the ability of man's attention to move in multiple ways in its inner realms and subjective space. So moving in your inner realms, uh, like if, if we say moving in your outer realms, is like moving around an object. We can say moving in your inner realms, like moving around the subject. But technically, you don't move, you're, you are the witnessing space. So I'm saying we human beings are at the peak of the, of the evolution of psychology, where we're like, could we all be part of a field right now? Like, like what is this rock in the middle of nowhere, you know? <laughs> I remember there's this book I'm working on, hopefully it'll be out there soon. The book is called God Like Spheres. And it was simply that moment where I'm like, no way. 
like the light from one sphere, like a star, is coming into my eyes, which is this orb, the smaller sphere. You're telling me light beams con connecting giant spheres to small spheres, and you know we're calling that sight. <laughs> like, the, like there's something about as if sphe the sphere is the mind. So on some level, if there was a subjective body, I would tell people it's most likely spherical. If we're in some sort of simulation, it's it's spherical. Because that's the most immediate relationship with form on a macro scale. That means it's as if, like, imagine the child comes and asks the teacher, and the teacher is teaching the planets to the children, you know? And, <laughs> you know, the child comes to the teacher and it's like, why are the planets here? You know, and so the person explains the Big Bang, and the person's like, why is the Big Bang here? And the child has no, no reception. The child is just ex experiencing asking the question. But you eventually see, if you were to take that question to its end, it would be a regression out of the dualistic. So on some level, your eyes are free. And then comes the idea of freedom. <laughs> and in some sense, like, this is the cool thing, guys. Sometimes in life, most people think it, it only has to be your external realms that are unknown. You can be unknown. Like, any time a person, two people have met each other, or just a bunch of people have met each other, what has happened is, like, unknown inner realms of men men in a known room. Do you know? Like on some level it's mind-blowing we're creatures on a rock. Like that is like who thought of this? The main task, guys, of the pilot of consciousness and the advanced communicator is that care for the unknown, watch your world, see how it's alive, see how its life is inseparable from how your mind is being your whole moment, and you're going to realize eventually there's experiential maturity. There's this concept they say where I really dislike it because people say like in yoga, the person goes and remembers all their lifetimes. I don't like the way they say that. I don't think it's, it's that's what's happening. I think what's happening is that the person is becoming space. When the person becomes space, they free themselves from the programs of a singular dimension. That means think of it this way. The way we travel to different dimensions is right now we're matter with a certain value in space. If, so we, we have to suddenly have this matter come, if, it, if we give it a numerical value, have this matter come to zero, just become space, and then. So, so in some sense, the stepping stone between the dimensions is space. And your mind is the access point to that. That means that this plane of existence is like a balcony. That means we are seeing this unknown unknown vastness, yet we are limited to our positioning, physical positioning. In one realm there's limitation, but in another there isn't. Your inner realms are unconditional. And when you realize that, your mind, you start honoring your own mind. It's strange. You know, people are going to be like, what do you mean you honor your mind? You buy power to yourself in the mirror, and I'll be like, no, but like that's a good idea. <laughs> It's just realizing that before the complex, the simple, the simple is here. And it's these simple moments in life where your mind is just being there, where it suddenly moves in new ways and revolutionizes your whole archetypal orientation as a creature. So experience is the spotlight of time. Your attention is the spotlight of meaning. That means like every person's viewpoints and ideologies.
Be grateful for wakefulness. I think that's the that's a that's a great uh, thing to echo in history. After some point, just I want you to imagine everything that you feel as a human being is like a weakness or impossible, something that's impossible to you. Okay. I want you to just consider that you have managed, and we say, okay, it's impossible. You've managed to envision the impossibility of something. But the question then comes, now use that impossibility and literally see what the reverse of that design would be. And you will find innovation. I'm telling you, there is a certain level of concentration that in any moment unlocks this viewpoint. It's literally like an eagle suddenly flying into the sky and it sees the whole forest. It sees the whole forest at once. And that's the universal memory. It's not a person having access to a memory. Like It's like you are just what, what's here, but the mind has an ability that it's so so like in your in your inner realms are so evocational that there can arise a moment where everything you know is echoing to itself it's like you put a mirror in front of every thought and all, I, I don't know how to say it it becomes this kind of kaleidoscopic in, in intuitive return to what was before you were <clears throat> and it's not an ideological truth really That's the that's the, the interesting thing that language can only take us so far in, in the interpretation of the world. And there's so many languages that haven't arrived, and one language that's gonna arrive, and hopefully I can contribute to its movement, is geometry is gonna be the next great language of all languages. Geometry is not a system. Geometry is not it's a language. It's 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 a body to the soul of the world. Like as much as people see maybe whatever kind of like multidimensionality a person perceives, I perceive a geometrical multidimensionality. That means it's like the moment you become aware of that, which is not, not, not like, like suddenly walking in a forest and you don't see straight lines in nature, but then that you notice you don't notice straight lines in nature and your attention suddenly has this hyper precision Hyper alertness to straight lines, to shape, to design, to color, to moment, to the depth of the moment. How the moment is like a screen. Is it a screen? How images arise. How life is an image. The objective experience is like we're literally being the stuff. <laughs> we're being the object, right? Right now, like, like a human being is speaking. Okay, so that, like, so what I mean by that, but the subjective realms are much more, we have so much more freedom in it. So this means that a person's communication is in some sense a fragment of the process of this dynamic changing thing with the world. <clears throat> that means we can only judge what we see and what we can't see, we can't judge, but what if what we can't see is the unconscious of that conscious system? The five elements, earth, air, fire, water, ether. So believe it or not, back in the day, space was considered an element. I feel in the future, there's going to be so many different kinds of human beings, so many different kinds of personalities, overpopulation is going to reach this exciting time, and of course, hopefully, we're going to be, start building sky cities in the civilization. And uh, <clears throat> that's the whole vision of Civilization 2.0, but <clears throat> I just want to see a world that realizes the value of what the mind can do. Because at the peak of what it does, it eventually witnesses it. That means you aren't just your actions. You are how they shifted your whole archetypal stance in the moment. 
That means when a person does something of wrong conduct, then suddenly they're shifting their archetype. It's as if they, 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 are, they are scarred by their dissension, by, by a snapshot of dissension. And that dissension is their own morality. Because you see, right now, it's like, a, again, good and bad kind of morality, but I think eventually it's going to go, all morality is going to be perceived as just efficiency and inefficiency and the efficiency of the collective self and the efficiency and the inefficiency of the individual self. Right now, I'm like an individual self, but I'm like, where's the collective self? And I realize we have to build it. That means it's like all those mystics in the mountain in one of my science fiction novels, I have like an, an image like this, where all the mystics, all those people who were trying to escape the material dimension, they realize an event is taking place that they are being called to participate. And it's like how the Titan was chained was suddenly released and returned to its task. It's, it's the evolution of power. It is no longer the shadow and light being at war. It's like at that point, the concept of wrath doesn't exist. The evolution is so wondrous that it's like there's no time for judgment. It's just, it's just the most efficient step. It's like the spirit of efficiency incarnate, you know. <clears throat> so guys if you have any questions please share um, um, by ether it's space and space was kind of like when you saw the four elements, you see the more primitive stance, I can explain much better, that it was as if like, okay, before the periodic table, you're a chemistry teacher, what are you teaching? You're like, all right, kids, you see this earth, you see this air, you see this water, you see this fire. <clears throat> These are all the ways that just elements on this planet can move. Do you know what that means? That means archetypes are elemental. We can totally associate and create a system where all the actors in the world, suddenly when they think of characters, they're thinking which element that character is. Is that character in, in a sort of fire element or water element? This elemental system is just, I'm kind of like contributing to Terence McKenna's vision of the archaic revival, that we something resurfaces that is like, it, it, it holds within it ancient momentum, yet it has a modern direction. So with ancient speed, we are directing ourselves to the future. <laughs> Ether is simply space. But back in the day, it was seen as the element that held all the elements together. So consciousness was seen as an element. Like that was a very, you can say, meta-materialistic explanation of consciousness. It's an element in a dimension we can't see. You know, that means it's like right now we're thinking we're sophisticated human beings, but we may be just like a simulation on the watch of like some uh, a deity beyond conception or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm just being playful, but I'm just saying the macro and the micro, it's just this profundity of how far the intelligence is choosing to identify with what's in this space or the space, or how what's in the space comes and goes. Shu Ramanamar, she gave the best advice. He's like, let what comes come, let what goes go, see what remains. And you don't know how many moments in my life where it was as if like the person has, I've been in dialogue with the person and the person has just, it's weird. Like sometimes in life happens where people are just rude, you know? And what that means is like suddenly like, you know, something hits the knight's armor. But the whole point is that not a single thing doesn't start war. That means like the master swordsman didn't touch the sword unless it was necessary. Do you see? There was always this, guys. There was this sort of contentment with the skill where you don't actually need to use it. 
you are seeing something beyond it. That means all those people out in yogic culture, they say, the, the guru, uh, sorry, not the guru, the, the yogi, the sadhu would suddenly in his meditation, his or her meditation, suddenly attain some sort of super uh, ability of some sort. They shouldn't use it. That's what they would say. They shouldn't use it, right? And the reason they would say they shouldn't use it is because if you are using it, you are not seeing something beyond it. You think that power is the end of the full value of everything. It's like Thor thinking like he has to just hammer everything for the rest of his life. And somebody would be like, yo, Thor, relax, man. You don't have to just break everything. It's like, I, we know you got to have it. like a divine hammer, but chill. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, you know, Thor's, you know, destroying wedding cakes. You know? <laughs> so guys, um, if there's no further questions, then I'm going to end the talk. Um, Meanwhile, something unique about this picture, I got to say, guys, when I saw this picture, I was like, I have to share this with the world because it's like literally those clouds are like the boat. Do you know what I mean? There's something strange about the resemblance of those clouds with the shape of that boat in, the, in this moment in the picture and the way those clouds are, you know. I'm telling you, suddenly geometry may open up in your life, and when it does, you know, you're, you, you're, you're, the pen has found your hand before you, you have, in some sense, uh, found the paper. So when something is important, it literally changes you. All those people who are like, I don't know, I don't know how to get over, <laughs> get over this, you know, troubling situation. You see, it's like, it's like it, whether you like it or not, time's going to eventually move. And the whole point of human activity is that you just can make decisions as life is happening. You can direct it. Like it, like that's the evolutionary advantage. So now if we are like, okay, so we all, we evolved after 4 billion years to have a consciousness that could direct itself. So that means when it comes to this exploration of the inner realms, we are the director. <clears throat> and when I use director, I mean like we are the navigator. That means when it comes to what you know about your own mind, you're the only torchbearer to wonder about the, the true intelligence that you hold, the, the genius that can suddenly appear. Do you know? Like, I'll tell you, like, uh, what was his name? Uh, Albert Camus, he had this quote where he's like, inspiration uh, or genius can suddenly find you as you're going through a revolving door. And can you just think about it? Imagine you're going to some mall or somewhere and you're going through a revolving door and it's like inspiration finds you. He suddenly gets the missing piece to what this is literary work. You see, there's, there's, it's strange. Now we have to live kind of like multiple lives. We have to live a life which is our physical continuity and survival, pretty much our experience of the objective realm. And then we have to live a life which is literally not for the body not for the brain which is a life for the potential of the mind <clears throat> so um kimberly um i see your question kimberly asked in the chat section when do you estimate change in language here's the thing the change is is it could be one of those things that only in a long term you can see so I don't know if you need a time travel machine but <laughs> but here's the idea language is a tool right now we're using this tool and we're using it unconsciously and when we use this tool, it's as if a mechanic using a wrench to fix an engine, and then the mechanic thinks the wrench is part of his hand. You know, like thinks that wrench is his hand. That's what people do when, when language disturbs their minds. And, and like you, the human being, its natural state should be a state where no language bothers them. It's just sound in the air. You know what I mean? On some level, you should, you, you should have that alertness. 
Do you know? Because if language disturbs you, there's this idea that like illusion can come and act like God, and then you you'd be like, oh, you know, you're just you're just an instinctual kind of reactive. Uh, it's like we don't want to be a reactive animal when we wonder about higher dimensions. You know? <laughs> The savage animal just like binding everything, you know, like we have to in some sense find a, a sort of stability. It's like from the stability of our current dimension we, we wonder about the other. And writing is the best way. Writing is one of the most, and in writing, the, the fascinating thing about writing is that as you write for a while, maybe the first couple sentences, it's just like your impressions on like sentence structure, and then after a while, you suddenly find your writer's voice, and you find your writer's voice when you suddenly find some, and is something important, important vision in your inner realms. And I feel that no, everybody has to kind of share their inner realms. Like that's the that's going to lead to some next level renaissance. Just trust life and share it. You know, the ears of the species is hyper multidimensional. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> Super hyper multidimensional beyond conception. <laughs> language is, uh, I mean, there was a time where the language would move first and then imagery in my mind. But when imagery moved first and then I began speaking, then that was, that was, that changed it. That's when my mind was faster than the moment. Because there was a, we, there's this language of image that the mind speaks and it's this subtle observance and this life sensitivity means that realize that every mass, similar to how it has a gravitation, do you know, we're thinking that if a biological body is leading to a subjective experience, that means, strangely, whatever the subjective appearance is could potentially be in the reflection of some mass gravitation vision. So that means your sense of self is gravitating world, worlds to itself. The mystery is far beyond one man's voice. I am just waiting for... Uh, you know, the writing, there's going to be such a, a, a strange thing where, you know, it, it, let me tell you, the world is going to become a place where the markets are artificial right now. Right now, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like artificial phase. But we're in the weird pioneering phase. <laughs> you know, it's artificial consumerism right now. But there will come a day where the entertainment industry will realize the value of the educational sector and will re ed entertainment will suddenly become replaced with insight. Do you know? That means imagine you turn on the TV and when you turn it off, you have literally no more about your world. You know? And of course, you know, I'm not saying, like, I, I, I'm not judging history. I'm just, I'm just sharing my parallel vision of how the world could move, you know? <clears throat> And believe it or not, it's like this, I think this is a universal law. If you don't try something, you'll never know. You'll never know how you would be like if you did it, you know? Like there is there is always that component when it comes to skill. Like I remember this, this is what inspired me to really draw. Like I draw sometimes. And like what really inspired me was just this, I was in this uh, looking outside a window and I had this sort of, boredom, this kind of like just watching the moment kind of vibe. And then I just felt like picking up the pen and drawing lines. I'm like, okay, let me just pick up the pen and see what it would be like drawing lines. And then I realized the free will. And then eventually I realized I could let my hand, for example, when I draw, be, be super still like a surgeon, or it could in some sense be free flow as if like I'm, 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 I'm using like, you know, I'm practicing with a spear, <laughs> you know, so there's different ways that the intelligence of something can open up to you when you engage it, you know.
You know, guys, Papaji would say the past is past because you can endlessly find problems with it. Tell me someone in the world who doesn't have a problem. <laughs> you see, like the past, you can look back at your past and be like, I could have done that better, I could have done that better, but eventually you see it's, it's how history is in the making. Life is moving. I think it's strange. It's, it's this kind of uh, view where when you stop playing games with life, it really happens. When the inner realms find the contentment, you know. Guys, when it comes to observation, The moment is the whole symphony. Sometimes it's like life is too much of a process for death to even be meaningful. You realize it's just, it's just happening on such a vast scale and you are a conscious opportunity. That's the thing, guys. I think these are the basic resources that human beings need. They need food. <laughs> they need water. You know, they need shelter. You know, they need company. And then what they need is vision. The, 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 the advancement of vision. That's where the unknown journey is taking the known. It's like, this is why guys in some of my writing, I, I've said black is the most beautiful color because it's everywhere, you know? And it's as if light, the, the dance of light, the dance of light and shadow is literally the birth of time. Sundials, guys. Sundials. <laughs> there was this mathematician back in the day in ancient Greece where, I'll share this story, where he was challenged and they told him measure the pyramids and this ancient Greek mathematician went there and he found a way and gave a measurement and in our history books we looked at it and it was like in some sense he was very close in his estimation just tiny detail off but everything was close and they were like how did this guy measure the pyramids so accurately back then. And the guy, in some sense, realized that the pyramid had a shadow. And he realized the sundial had a shadow. And the shadow was the reflection of the exact measure, like a measurement, certain exact measurement, so he could compare the ratio, you know, of the sundial to the shadow and compare the ratio of uh, the shadow, they could measure the shadow of the pyramids, but they couldn't measure the pyramids. You see how fascinating ma mathematics is, guys? Like, you know? And so through that, through that, it was as if he realized, in some sense, they measured the shadow, and that, that was the measurement, and that's how accurate it was. He got, he got the shadow of the pyramids right. At a certain time, at the same time as the sun doll was. <laughs> um,
You know, guys, sometimes I know, like, I could tell you this, like, sometimes I think it's playful. Like, sometimes I <clears throat> just consciously, intently, I just sit still and I close my eyes and I try to, like, how can I say it? I visualize a shape while my eyes are closed, like any shape, anything you can visualize. And I, as I, like, have this, like, concentrated focus on that inner shape, I open my eyes and that inner shape is there simultaneously as the attention is is the ultimate door really. By the way, uh, by the way, guys, like pretty much the talks ended at this point, but uh, Q and A is open if anybody wants to has a like a real question, <laughs> like a, like uh like you know something that the unknown is not forgotten. In. Guys, one one quote that I remember I was very proud of, I was like, yeah, this is a good quote. <laughs> and it was something that I wrote where it was, geometry is the next great language of all languages. Geometry is a way where the chaos and order manifests. Every, it's like every inner, whatever phenomenology there is in the inner realm. And like right now I'm in this physical room kind of like speaking. It's like similarly I'm like my attention is... See, like the, the inner realm occurs. That means any person who ever has thoughts, what like where are those thoughts happening? You know? So, so it, it's the inner realms moving. So we, we, in our stillness, we notice the mind's activity. The mind's activity is projective. It's like, again, the ripple like the pond to the thing. This is why I'm telling you guys, like, this is the best strategy. Just remember it, you know, share it with as many people as you can. Anytime when you get, when two, uh, people are angry, let's say uh, two people are angry that know each other, in some sense, the, like, let's say this is perfect couple therapy. Angry couples, they should just lie down on the ground on their backs when they're angry and talk like that finish the conversation like that. I'm telling you there's something strange of that's the instant like, you know, uh, fire extinguisher, you know. <laughs> Anyways, guys, um, I want to thank everyone for listening, you know, I'm getting close to this episode 111 and I, and even though the numbers are kind of changed, but I, I can tell you that when I started these talks in 2014, the only thing that was kind of like inspiring me was just the what if and I'm telling you, I think that's the that's the thing that modern civilization is missing, to trust its own what if. 
Sometimes the world doesn't know better, so the world can't even comment on something that your inner realms that you must externalize. Vision is only truly found, and the moment it's found, action is instantaneous. That means if you look for the action first, then the vision, in some sense you're, there's a delay in your, in your truth, in your moment. But if you'll find vision first, then, then seek the language, then you'll see it's instant. Your mind is being the world as while it's being yourself. How, how interesting. You know, the mind is like a sphere of awareness taking everything in as itself. You know, we are way more multidimensional than we've been told. You know, we're so multidimensional that it's like, you know, at some point I was like, what is this? Like, you know, I created the concept of language threshold. You know? <laughs> The language threshold, I'm telling you, I think it's one of the most beautiful concepts ever made. You know, the reason is, I'm not just like, because I, I made it, I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying the idea is incredible because it's suggesting experience is beyond language. So when Ludwig Wittgenstein said the limits of my language are my world, he meant the limits of his language is how far he could express his inner world. It didn't mean that's the edge of the inner world. So we got a kind of civilization 2.0 is for a multidimensional being, not just a singular being. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Much blessings and uh, namaste. And those who trust the wind of evolution, your eyes will remember the honor of a lifetime. That means any human being on this planet that just something, there is some sort of compass of some sort of vision in you that's making you care for an advanced civilization that means while everybody's just living their own lives, there is there's this song we all hear. And this song is like, rise, mankind, rise. Advance. Now or never. That's the gamble. That every moment that the person can do something, if they don't, the moment is gone. That's the value of freedom. It is that in time, you're existing in a system, our eyes opened up in a system that was here before us, you yeah? So anyways, guys, um, one last thing to say before I... <laughs> one last, I, I've, I've, like, it's like, I've been trying to say this one last thing for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> but one last thing I want to say, guys. Um, uh, in the Patreon community, <laughs> like in, I've called it the School of Athens 2.0, and any who, any person who's listening who wants to support my efforts in this, what uh, my projects, like there's, I'm sharing, uh, like uh, patrons get free books, pretty much all the books that I'm gonna put out. Patrons get them for free, you know, and uh, plus the artwork, you know, like I have these projects I'm going. So anyways, I want to say if anybody wants to uh, share more or communicate more or ask a deeper question, that's the perfect like social media thing pretty much. Like the apps on my phone, I can, <laughs> I can engage, you know. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and us. Let reality be nature knows before man does.